but John 17, you may have picked up right from the very first few verses, is that we have a prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, um, to his Father, God in the heavens above. And it's obviously quite a heartfelt prayer, and I think you would have got that in the words as we've worked through that. It's a, it's a lengthy prayer in terms of what the Bible records, um, and it's going to be something we'll spend a little bit of time on um, tonight. You may have picked up in the first few uh, verses uh, a key idea I just wanted to share with you right up front. We see in verse 1 that it is a prayer to the Father, um, and he is, um, the Lord Jesus Christ is asking him to, to glorify um, the Son. But he goes on in verse 2 to talk about eternal life, and that's obviously a very big Bible topic, um, but one that we're deeply interested in because, of course, we don't live forever, and the Bible offers a hope of, of living forever. Um, and so it's not our subject tonight to sort of explore that, but it's something that really excites us to, to think about and to talk about. But what Jesus share, shares with us or in this prayer in verse 3 is that eternal life, well, it is eternal life to come to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So obviously our subject tonight is critically important because we are planning to at least have a little bit of a look at the subject of God, very large subject, the Lord Jesus Christ likewise. Um, and you might say, well, what about then the Holy Spirit? Um, that's the other aspect we want to talk about tonight, or the Spirit of God. It's not actually mentioned here in verse 3 of, of this prayer. And, and that's quite interesting in itself, because obviously this is really important words that Jesus is sharing in this prayer, really important ideas. He's going to include his believers, his disciples in this prayer. Um, and, and we hope to see later on, we, we believe us also, uh, we're included in that prayer. So, so what about the Holy Spirit? Now, you may be aware that there's a very large um, doctrinal uh, teaching that a lot of the Christian world would teach uh, known as the Trinity. Um, it's not our subject to really sort of explore the Trinity in depth tonight, but one of the key um, aspects or teachings that comes out of the Trinity is the fact that the Holy Spirit um, is a being in itself, an entity in itself, uh, in much the same way God and Jesus Christ are, and they're all connected together. And if that was the case, I would have thought that Jesus would have perhaps mentioned that here in this prayer when he talks about life eternal, to know um, if the Holy Spirit was such a being that this perhaps would be that time to mention it, but he doesn't. And so for us tonight then, it's very important before we go any further to define what or who is the Holy Spirit, because that's the link right now that we're missing, perhaps. Uh, and I hope to show you then as we come back to John 17... Um, that we'll be able to put that all together and see that there is a relationship. They are related, absolutely. But we need to first understand um, what or who the Holy Spirit is. So we can do that very simply by firstly having a look at the, the Bible text, and tonight isn't trying to get too technical, I hope, but we do need to explore a couple of ideas. So when we have a look at the way the word is translated in the Bible, you may be aware that the Old Testament was written originally in the Hebrew language, the New Testament written in the Greek language. So for us to understand the word spirit in the Bible, we kind of need to tease that apart and go back and have a look at the original um, Hebrew and Greek words. Um, now, I'm obviously not an expert on those, so we've, we've looked at um, uh, the resources that can assist us in that way. We actually learn that the word in the Greek is, is pneuma, um, and we will probably see some, a lot of connections to words we use today, which of course come from the Greek, um, such as uh, pneumatic, for example, which has that connection with, with air. And of course, as we see at the bottom of that slide, the, the meaning of that word is, is either a wind or breath by extension. Likewise, in the Hebrew language, when we go back and look at the word ruach in the Hebrew, once again, a very similar meaning. So across the Bible, um, we have a consistency of teaching that when we read the word spirit, it simply has the idea of, of a wind or breath. Not too difficult to understand. And I hope we'll come to see, actually, that the wind or breath is connected with God himself, the God of heaven and earth, who we're speaking about tonight, and, and therefore is an extension of God. As the breath is an extension of us that comes out of our mouth, so also we will see the spirit has that idea. It's connected with God himself. And we might say, like the light and the heat that come from the sun are connected from the source, the sun, we might say that the spirit in 
that metaphor is also connected. It's connected to God as the source of that, as our breath, um, obviously, is sourced from us. Not particularly con a complex idea. One of the other things you may notice as you uh, look through the Bible is sometimes we find um, the word ghost used, Holy Ghost, okay? And uh, sometimes uh, some translations will put spirit, sometimes um, ghost. Perhaps it's something that was uh, only done um, back in the, the version that we have, in, or I have in front of me, which is, was um, created in 1611. Um, but we do find that most modern translations have re-looked at that word and understood it to simply mean, as we see here, um, wind or breath, and consistently then translated it as the Spirit of God. So what do we know about um, God and his Spirit, very simply up front? Well, just to present you with a couple of simple quotes that the Bible might um, tell us about God, we actually find that the Bible tells us that God is located, okay? He has a location, um, and that is actually in heaven. Now, we don't, of course, know that exact location within heaven, um, some versions would, would talk about the heaven of heavens. Uh, once again, that probably doesn't help us all that much when we put that into Google Maps. So, but it is heaven all the same, that God is located. And so we might say, how then does God understand everything that happens upon the face of the earth? Because the Bible talks a lot about that. Um, and this psalm that's on the screen is perhaps a way we can understand that. God is everywhere by that spirit power. So we're suggesting here that the spirit is an extension of God, and in this instance... Uh, his power. And so the psalm says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, with, or where should I flee from thy presence? In other words, God is aware of what is going on in the earth via his spirit power, is the suggestion from that quote. And we'll explore that a little bit more. So bear with us at the moment, but that's what I'm suggesting to you, is one way we can understand the spirit of God. Now, one of the other things that we may, and this is, by the way, a really big subject when we come to start talking about the, uh, the Spirit and the Holy Spirit of, of God, we can sort of find many books that are, we can probably keep piling books up on the, bench, on the desk, actually, of, of, that have been written about this subject. It's a wonderful subject. Anyway, um, when we read about the Spirit and the Holy Spirit in the Bible, um, for the purposes of tonight, I don't want to get too caught up on uh, whether we're talking about Spirit or Holy Spirit. What you'll actually find, to be fair, uh, in texts of the Bible, that often they are, used, um, uh, they are used within the same context. Now, you might say, well, well, why is that? Well, let's just have a look at the word holy for a, for a moment. The word holy really simply has the idea of being sacred, consecrated, dedicated. You might say special, all right? And so when we're talking about God's Spirit... Um, of course, in that sense, it's not hard to understand how it might be dedicated, consecrated, or, or, or a special uh, power that God has. Just to prove that for you, um, if you have a look on the screen, you'll actually identify, here's two gospel records, okay? I say gospel records, they're the records of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew and in Luke, but they're identifying the very same uh, activity uh, or, or event, which is the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will note that one writer refers to the Spirit of God and one writer refers to the Holy Ghost, or as I said before, the word should be consistently translated Spirit. And there are many other references we could provide to show that the Bible does sometimes use either the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. So let's not get too concerned about that. When we're looking at that, we are referring more generally to the Spirit of God. So the first thing I want to do with you is I want to share the idea that the Spirit of God is the physical power that he has. And to do that, we just need to come right back to the very first reference to it in the Bible, which is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. So first chapter of the Bible, first book of the Bible, second verse. Even I can find that quite quickly. So what are we saying? We're now saying the Spirit of God is the power of God. And let's reflect upon what's presented for us here. Here we have the beginning, as the Bible describes it. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. So there it is, the God that we understand from the Bible is the one that created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And here it is, the first uh, reference to the Spirit, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So we have here the word spirit connected with God right from the very first chapter. 
Now, I'm sure you're familiar with what we find in the book of Genesis, but what we find in the book of Genesis is undoubtedly, in these first few chapters, the creation of everything that we have on the face of the earth. And actually, we don't read the word spirit again um, in this section of the record at all. But what we do read is quite interesting because in verse 3, in verse 6, and in verse 9, and so on and so on, we can keep looking through this chapter. If you glance through it, you will keep reading that God said, God said, God said, and the word of God, the things that he was saying, the result of that was the creation of more aspects of the world around about us. So in verse 2, we see the spirit of God. And once again, if we were to look at what we looked at previously at what that means, the, the breath or the um, that, that extended power of God was moving upon the face of the waters, perhaps we might say ready for action, ready to create. And when God said, then through his spirit power, these events were performed. Now, how do I come to that conclusion? Well, it doesn't mention the word spirit again in this chapter. So what I'd like you to do is just to come across to Psalm 104 and have a look at what the psalmist, in reflecting upon what God did in creation, let's see what the psalmist had to say. So in Psalm 104 and verse 2, we have the context, who covereth thy, talking of God, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be moved forever. And so the context here is clearly the creative work of God. If you actually come down to verse 29, the writer here goes on to say, Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled, thou takest away thy breath, they die and return to the dust. Now, just to pause there for a moment, if we were to look at the Hebrew text here for that verse, because of course we're in the Old Testament, the ancient Hebrew is the background to this, the word breath there is actually the very same word we would typically translate as spirit. So here we could get the idea, of course, that the spirit breath of God, that power of God, was the very thing that energises us as human beings, that gives us life. It's that spirit power of God. Verse 30, Thou sendeth forth thy spirit, they are created. So there it is. Back in Genesis 2, we saw the spirit of God upon the face of the waters. The psalmist, now reflecting upon those ideas, said, God sent forth his spirit and they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. So certainly from this writer's point of view, he sees the spirit as the creative power of God in Genesis chapter 1. And so we might say God's breath, which could be seen as God's words, okay, as an extension of that idea, was that uh, brought forth that power, or, or by that enabling power, was what created all things. Quite an interesting idea. We'll have a look at that again. So initially, we're saying the Spirit of God in one aspect is his physical power to create and to maintain life and maintain our life. But the idea of the Spirit isn't just limited to that. There's more to it. There's much more depth to the idea. So the other aspect, if we've got the physical on one hand, the other aspect of the Spirit of God is, is a moral element, a moral power, if you like. Now, that's interesting. What do we mean by that? Genesis chapter 6. The next time we read about Spirit comes to us in Genesis chapter 6. Now, this story is the story of Noah. And we learn, of course, in this story that God is to destroy the earth because of wickedness. Um, but let's have a look what we see in the first few verses here. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet in his days 
sorry, yet his day shall be 120 years. So God was going to limit uh, the existence of mankind in this chapter and we actually find the outcome of that is God would send rain and in chapter 7 and verse 4, God's physical power would flood the earth and destroy all other human beings other than Noah and his family who were saved within the ark. That's the story that we have here in front of us. But we read there in verse 3 that God said, my spirit shall not always strive. Now, the idea that we're getting there is God struggling or striving against what? Well, those that have alternative views to him, mankind upon the face of the earth, who's doing what God didn't want them to do. Now, it clearly can't be talking about God's power because in one chapter's time, God's going to say, well, it's easy. I'm going to destroy the entire earth. Okay, so this is not a struggle here against the power of God. It can't be. Because in the very same word, uh, verse, he says, I'm going to limit the days of humankind upon the face of the earth. So what is God struggling against? What is he striving against? Well, I'd like to put up a couple more quotes on the screen to sort of establish an idea here. You see, we have two references here to um, the uh, wandering of the children of Israel, God's people, the nation of Israel throughout the wilderness. And we find that when we follow that story of God's people in the wilderness, there were so many times when they upset God because they did what he didn't want them to do. He went against God's will, or they went against God's will. And reflecting upon that, um, the prophet Isaiah and the psalmist um, in Psalm 78 um, share these words with us. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. And from the psalm, how oft they did provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert. And that word vex and grieve, as I've got a note at the bottom there, are the same idea in the Hebrew. And it's related, if you like, to the same word here, strive. And so God clearly is not striving uh, through sort of lack of power to deal with this situation. He would destroy those that were um, wicked in the wilderness in much the same way in this chapter tonight. He would destroy the earth and those that were unfaithful in Noah's time. So I'll put to you that what God is striving against here is the fact that the thinking, the thoughts, the actions, the words of those that God's involved in here were opposite to his. And so what God is grieved with is their thinking and their words, if you like, the things that they're saying. And so when we think about spirit then, it broadens our thinking to understand it as the extension of God. We've already said it's breath, isn't it? And we've extended that to see even in Genesis 1, we saw the idea of words connected and then power. Well, I'm saying all of those things are true. And you might say, well, that's a lot of, a lot of ideas there. Well, you know, it's not actually too far out of what we understand in today's um, terminology. You see, we would often, uh, well, maybe not often, but we would use the word spirit in, in a similar context. We may say, uh, for example, um, Bob's spirit lives on in that speech that his son gave today, all right? By which we mean that all the thoughts and the ideas and everything that Bob once was is now really sort of being uh, brought out in his son and in his son's words. You see, those thoughts and those ideas are an extension, aren't they, of the person. And so it has a moral power. Now, if we're struggling a little bit with that, let's, let's move to the next reference, Psalm 51, and have a look at this uh, reference again in the psalm. Now, here we have Psalm 51. You'll you know, possibly be aware that we have here the words of the great King David. Um, and we almost have here like a, a personal diary of David as he's reflecting upon uh, a sin that he has committed against God. Okay, sin in a Bible terms is to go against God's will. And David is very much feeling this in his conscience. And he's now going to share this with God in what is a very intimate prayer. It just helps us to come to understand this concept of spirit. Uh, verse 10 and 12, we see David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. 
Verse 1 and 2, look at the ideas David has here. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And my transgressions there is his sins, the things that he's done wrong. He's asking God to forget them, to blot them out so they, they don't exist anymore, so he can move on. Verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So there's this concept in this chapter of being cleansed or purified from the things that he's done wrong. And of course, we know what he's asking for here is to have his conscience cleaned, isn't he? We, I mean, we understand those concepts. They're not difficult, are they? To clean my conscience that I can now make a fresh start. I want to move on, but I first need to be cleansed. So let's just move back to the verses we started with. When we look at verse 10 and 11, he's asking for a right spirit within him. Now, we understand, as I said before, that concept because we understand when we talk about the spirit of somebody, we're talking about all the, the ideas, the thoughts, really what that person is. And David's saying, I want the spirit within me. I want the way I think to be right. I want to be cleansed, as he said in verse 2 because I've sinned and my conscience um, is marred. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, what's he asking God not to take from him? Is the context of this psalm saying, God, don't take away my life? Because we saw before that from the psalm previously, we saw that the Holy Spirit was the very thing that was keeping us alive. And it's the power of God to create. Is that, the, is that what God's... That David's asking God not to take away from him. Of course not. It doesn't fit the context. David, for, not for one minute in this psalm, is saying, God, don't take away my life. What he's asking God to do quite clearly from this context is, God, don't take away that thinking which is so precious to me, which I get from you. I want to remain thinking the words, the thoughts that would be shared by you, God. Don't take that away from me. Cleanse me from the thoughts I've had which aren't good and enable me to keep that right way of thinking within my mind. So that's the other element to what the Bible shares with us about the spirit. On one hand, it's a physical power to do things that God has. But on the other hand, it is the power of God through his words and his thoughts to change lives and to change minds. Now we get that quite a number of times in the Bible. I want to share with you two quotes that are very well known to Christadelphians. And they, they present to us exactly the same thought process. You see, the Bible, we believe, from this particular verse and, and several others, is the word of God himself, or the words of God. And the young man, Timothy, was told this by the Apostle Paul. And, and Paul said to him that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now, once again, really fascinating because if you look at the Greek, because we're in the New Testament in this reference, the Greek idea there is God breathed. So you can't help but see that connection, can you, to the idea of spirit, the idea of the spirit being God's breath. Here we have the word that we have in front of us. It's as if it was God's very breath. Okay, by extension, his thoughts, by extension, his words. And what does it do? Well, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. You see, these are things that happen in the mind, aren't they? These are moral characteristics. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, as that idea is there, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The outcome of that is it'll actually change the way you live. It'll change the way you think, which will change the way you live. But what is it? It's God's breathed words. It's his spirit word. So there's another reference that we may quite often use. And this one's by the Apostle Peter. And he says, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture, once again, we're talking about the Bible, as the word scripture is there, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So there it is, the Holy Spirit as the power of God shaped the hearts and minds of those that wrote God's words, which in turn is the power that God has given us to shape us, to correct us, as we saw before, to have us living in a way of righteousness. And so like the breath is an extension of a person, 
the spirit is an extension of all who God, of everything that God is. It's an extension of that thought, that word, that power of God. So to put it simply, what we've found so far, and I think as you look through scripture, we find that when we read about spirit, we're seeing the physical power of God. And also as we read his words, we're seeing it has a moral element to that as well, a moral power to change people. And that's a really important thing to understand. So there's no rule, there's no rule to, well, there is no teaching in the Bible that would have us come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is in fact a being of itself. But you can understand when you read the Bible that the Spirit is a very complex idea because we, of course, see the beauty in the fact that it is really representative of all God is. And we say that today, don't we? If, if we're talking about someone's spirit, we're talking about their whole disposition, their whole outlook, everything that they think, their thoughts, their actions. And that's what we have before us. So I want to hold that thought now and then move on to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. How was the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God? And this is where we'll see the Holy Spirit and the relationship between them. Because we want to have a look now first at the physical power which God brought to bear to bring about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. For those that are unaware of this story, in Luke chapter 1, the beginning here of the New Testament, we have the beginning of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is quite clear that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't uh, always exist. In fact, he was clearly born. And we're going to learn that it all came about through God's power, the Holy Spirit. Verse 28 to 35. And the angel came in unto her, we're talking about the young uh, Virgin Mary from the verse before, and said, Hail thou that highly favoured, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign upon that, um, over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. All right, so there was a very literal sense in the, Lord, in the way that the Lord Jesus Christ would be the Son of God because he was born of a Virgin Mary with, God, uh, with God's power of the Holy Spirit, as defined for us in verse 35. And in a sense, the verse goes on to help us define that when it says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee and the power of the highest. There it is. By definition, the Holy Spirit is, in fact, the power of God that would have an action upon Mary to bring about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is that whilst he was born through the power of God, through Mary, he was nonetheless a man in the sense of the nature that he bore. In the, uh, the failings, in the... Um, in the weakness that he had, certainly he did not sin, but in the weakness that he had, in the nature that he bore, we learn from Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 10 to 14, we won't turn there for tonight, but he had the same nature as we experience um, with all the temptations to sin and all the weakness um, that we, we bear, the Lord Jesus Christ did also, but he did not sin through um, the power of his God that was with him, and we'll come to explore that a little bit further. But there it is. We see initially, here it is. In the first instance, the power of God through the Holy Spirit gave conception to Mary, which resulted then in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're beginning to understand how God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are related. Well, the Holy Spirit happens to be the power by which God achieves the things that he does. And in this instance, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ came about through the power of God. 
Now, as we've already seen, though, you, you saw on one hand we talked about the physical power of God. The other important element here is the moral power of God to change, to develop people. And that is very critical when we also come to have a look at the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share that with you now in John chapter 10. I want to have a look at how God would develop his son through the moral power of his words that would shape his life. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, um, a discussion here of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Jews that were around him, and he said there in verse 30, I and my father are one. Now you can begin to understand, as we've explored what we have so far, that if somebody is, if somebody is uh, influenced, or, or should, should I say, um, shaped by the, the power, both morally and physically, um, of their father, then you could quite happily say and understand that God and Jesus were one in everything in terms of their outlook, in terms of the things they would say, the things that they wanted to do in their purpose. And that's what Jesus is sharing here. But the Jews are very unhappy. Look what they say. The Jews took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent unto the world, thou blasphemest, because I am the Son of God? So what's Jesus trying to tell us here? Well, he's explaining to the Jews that back um, in Old Testament times, and we can find there recorded in Scripture in the psalm, that God had already said to the nation of Israel that they could become representatives of God. And so we have the phrase there, ye are gods. And how would that be? Well, verse 35 tells us, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and so Jesus is telling us here, isn't he, that the word of God, which we've just seen tonight, is the moral power of God to change lives, is the very agency by which God would use to have human beings represent him by being changed by that word of God. Because in verse 36, he goes on to say, whom the Father hath sanctified. And that's perhaps a word that we're not that familiar with. But very simply, the idea of sanctified is to... To, um, to develop, to shape, to purify. And the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that what God intended was his words, his ideas, his thoughts would shape and develop our minds to the point where we could represent God himself. And Jesus is saying, what can't you understand about me saying, I and my Father are one? I represent everything my Father says and does. In verse 37, he said, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. So can you see that flow of thought? Let's just put that on the screen. What Jesus is trying to tell us is that from the moral power, through the words of God, we can be sanctified. And in this instance, the Lord Jesus Christ came to be the son of God, not only by his birth, but also by the moral power that he held. Because guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ followed the words of God perfectly. In fact, he said on many occasions, I, I don't speak my own words, I speak the words that God has given me. So he fully represented his father. The Lord Jesus Christ had been developed through the words of his father. You know, we have that idea shared to us a lot in Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 5, we won't go there now, but in much the same way we saw in the words of David, Ephesians 5 talks about being sanctified or cleansed by the water of the word. And so the words of God are, are used in, in a sort of a washing metaphor to be able to cleanse and to purify our minds. There's a moral power, isn't there, to change our minds. You know, the Jews were struggling here that he was trying to make himself equal with God. Well, they weren't listening to what he said, because in the verse before, verse 29, he said, My father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Talking about the disciples or the sheep. 
And so Jesus had clearly already laid out, my father is the greatest of all. So the Lord Jesus Christ is not claiming that equality with God, but he is absolutely one in the way he thinks and the way he acts. And so you might want to note uh, John chapter 7 and verse 16. Jesus Christ says, my doctrines, my teachings come from God. John chapter 14 and verse 28, Jesus said, the father is greater than I. I want to just um, fill that idea out from Isaiah chapter 11. Just come back to the prophet Isaiah who's reflecting upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that would come about. In case the words of John 10, we sort of thought, "Mm, not too sure about that. Let's have a look at Isaiah chapter 11 because what that really shows us is that the work of God, the spirit of God, the spirit moral power of God would be the thing that would shape his son. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, Jesse was the, uh, the father of David and in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the language in verse 1 here, um, we don't have time to explore that, but I'm happy to share that with you, is a clear reference to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. A branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit, here we go, we've got that idea for us again, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God, shall rest upon him. Now, what's that spirit going to look like? Well, here it is. It's the spirit of wisdom the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So you can see, can't you, that God would provide, we know both the physical power that he had on the Lord Jesus Christ, but perhaps just as importantly, God would work with the Lord Jesus Christ to shape his heart and his mind to reflect God himself. And so that spirit is more than just physical power. So we put those two things together. The Lord Jesus Christ is a result of, yes, the Holy Spirit power working upon Mary to achieve conception, and he was born. But just as importantly, the word of God would shape and purify and develop his mind to bring about the Son of God, in such a manner that he was, to the point where he could say, I and my Father are one. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, we won't turn there again, but we see that God was in Christ. We, we, We read that language. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Now, sometimes you may actually struggle to think, how was God in Christ? What does that exactly mean? Well, now we we understand that, don't we? Because everything that God is expressed in his spirit, as we've seen here, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, all of those things were, of course, shared by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you could very easily understand now how God was in Christ through those ideas and would achieve um, the reconciling or the um, bringing back of, of the world to himself, the saving of the world. So we've got those ideas together. What about our relationship? Because we've learnt about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How does our relationship work together with them? I want to come back to John chapter 17. Because I think now we can understand John 17 in a perhaps a different way that perhaps we couldn't see before. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ here is talking about a work that he was doing, a work with his disciples, his believers, his followers. In verse 4, he said, I've glorified thee on earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do, which was to teach and to develop his disciples, his followers. How was he going to achieve that? Well, there's an enormous emphasis in this chapter, and I want to show you that. You might well, may not have seen this before. Verse 14, I have given them thy word. Back in verse 8, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they received them. Verse 6, I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest, me, gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. You see, there's a really large emphasis in John chapter 17 of the word of God. We could actually now, with our understanding, we could put the word spirit in there, couldn't we? 
and say it's the spirit word of God that Jesus said, I've completed your work because your word has worked with my followers to shape them and to develop them. It's the, to develop them. It's the moral power of God that was able to shape the lives of those believers. And so in those verses, we saw that they were given, they received, and they kept those words. Verse 17, what were those words? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So, so we sort of build on that definition to go, well, God's word is, of course, truth, isn't it? Of course it's true because it's come from God. And now we get some language we're already familiar with. We've looked at this tonight from verse 19. For thy sakes I sanctify myself, that I might also be sanctified through the truth. So there we've got that idea of being changed, purified, to de be developed through God's words, through the truth. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone. He's referring there to his close followers. But for them who which shall believe on me through their word. And that we believe is a, an extension to include us also. Because we're here referring in this verse to the words that were given to his close disciples, which would then be shared to the rest of the world. And we have a, a, a book um, of the Acts of the Apostles where we read of Jesus' followers going out into the rest of the world and actually sharing the words that they'd been shared by the Lord Jesus Christ, God's thoughts, God's words. And that would change the hearts and minds of the whole world, and that's why we're here now. We don't believe that it's the Holy Spirit power of God that's influenced us today, but it's the Holy Spirit moral power through his words that have shaped our hearts and our minds. And that's what Jesus is sharing in this chapter. It's the words that are powerful to shape us. In verse 21, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so now it's not hard to understand, is it, that if we share the thoughts, the words of God that the Lord Jesus Christ shares, then it makes sense, doesn't it, that we're all one, we're united in the way that we think. We can understand that concept. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And, it, and it's a lovely thought, isn't it? It's a wonderful thought that we are one, or we can be one, with God. And that's why Jesus said from verse 3, if you remember where we started, it's life eternal to know. You see, the important thing is we've got to know something. And tonight we're just beginning at the very start to know something about God and Jesus Christ and what the Holy Spirit is. There's no reference to the Holy Spirit being a person because that's not what the idea shares with us. You know, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, if you come across to Romans chapter 8, shares this idea, but instead of using the word word, he now uses the word spirit. But we understand that now. Romans chapter 8. And perhaps just to, um, perhaps just to put that on the screen which may be helpful as we go through this. Verse 1 to 10. We'll just pick a few verses out. Verse 1. There is now there no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we've we put those two ideas on in the, um, the little um, table on the screen there to indicate that um, when we talk about the flesh, those that walk after the flesh, what are we talking about? Well, it's those that simply respond to the, uh, the thoughts that come into their mind without the influence of the moral power of God's word. And so Paul describes for us in verse 2 that it's the power of sin and death. It's a response to um, that will lead only to sin and death. But by contrast, he's talking about the spirit. And we could add there the spirit word of God, which he also refers to as the spirit of life. Verse 5 is very interesting. How does all that come about? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And here's the point that's critical for us, is that the element of this that we need to understand is this is not something that happens, as it were, magically on us. 
but it requires us being mindful. It requires us, as Paul says here, engaging our minds on this. So we've got a choice to make. We can either follow the thinking of our own natural um, desires and, as he calls it here, the flesh, another big subject of the Bible, um, or we can follow, as we've seen before, the spirit word of God which can shape our hearts and our minds. Verse um, 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. There it is. The natural mind is, is uh, enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but they that are in the flesh, sorry, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the outcome of following in the spirit word of God, that way of thinking is an understanding of righteousness. We come to understand what's right from God's perspective. And what does it mean when spirit dwells in you? Well, we've come to understand that. We've seen that tonight. We're talking about the spirit power of God, his word, his thoughts in our minds. As we said before, the most important thing there in that section is verse 5. We've got to be mindful. We've got to engage our minds with these ideas. And so the power of life, Paul is telling us, is that our minds may be changed through the spirit word of God to shape us. Just to conclude, Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll conclude there. Just to bring this relationship together understand these elements we've talked about. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, for bearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we understand that, don't we? The unity of God's way of thinking, which comes from his word. You've seen that in the previous verses. He's talking about characteristics which come from God's way of thinking. Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. There is one body and one spirit. Of course there's one spirit because it comes from God. Even as ye are called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there's our relationship. We have one God. We have his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we've seen a little bit of tonight. And finally, we have the spirit, which is, as we said before, the moral and that physical power of God that can change our hearts and our minds. Well, certainly that moral element of it can, as we've seen, change our hearts and minds to make us acceptable to God.